for penalty perjury. The testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Have a seat. Make sure you speak up. Now, uh, Mr. Apker, I'm going to ask you to, to speak loud and, and right into that microphone to the point where the microphone's almost uncomfortable. And state and spell your name for the record, please. My name is Jerry Apker. It's spelled J E R R Y A P K E R. And I know you're retired, but how long ago did you retire, sir? I retired from the Division of Wildlife in 2017. And can you explain? for the jury and the court, um, how long you worked for the Colorado Division of Wildlife, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and um, what positions you held within that organization over the last several decades? I worked for, uh, when I was hired, it was Colorado Division of Wildlife. I worked there for 38 years. When I retired, it was Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, I started as a district wildlife manager commonly known as a game warden. I was assigned two different districts in that time. I was in Fort Garland on the east side of the San Luis Valley, and I was in the Pikes Peak District, um, west of Colorado Springs. I then promoted to area manager, which supervises the wildlife officers, and I was assigned uh, the west side of Denver, um, Colvin, and Idaho Springs up to the Continental Divide. and. Uh, and then transferred back to the San Luis Valley um, as an area supervisor. And then in 2000, um, I was promoted to the staff biologist for the terrestrial sections, emphasizing uh, bears and lions, coyotes, carnivores. And, and, and starting with your first position with Colorado Division of Wildlife, that was, can you say again what that was and tell the jury a little bit more about what your experience was in that initial position, please. So um, district wildlife manager, most people think of them as game wardens. It's the law enforcement officers that you see driving around in the trucks. Um, in Colorado, the district wildlife manager position is a multi-purpose position. They have law enforcement responsibilities. They're fully certified as commissioned officers in the state of Colorado. Um, but they also have education responsibilities, uh, teaching hunter education, that kind of stuff, community relations, working with county commissions and city councils where necessary. And in some cases, like in my circumstance, in, in uh, Pikes Peak District, Fort Carson was in my district, and so I worked with the uh, command structure in Fort Carson, and that included Pinion Canyon Army, Army Maneuver Site down in southeast Colorado. Um, in this initial position with Colorado um, Division of Wildlife, and as a game manager, did that give you the opportunity to get in the field and observe game, carnivores, bears, mountain lions? Yeah, all? essentially my uh, pickup truck was my office. I did have a small office in my home. But, um, I remember my first big game season, I slept in my truck overnight, probably more than I slept in my home. Um, just trying to make an, a big impression on the district that I had, which was at the time kind of considered one of the most dangerous districts in the state. Why is that? Uh, there was a lot of poaching involved in that historic area. There was a, a major land grant, one of the biggest land grants, Spanish land grants in Colorado had been divided into two large ranches. One of the ranches, there was a lot of historic um, use from the original settlers, were, which were Spanish settlers, um, the original town of San Luis. And there was a lot of historic poaching that went on in that area. And then as you testified, you, you got, I assume it's promoted to area wildlife manager, and that was in the San Luis Valley from about 91 to 2000, is that right? Yeah, I was in, I was in Denver from 1990 until 1992, then transferred back to the San Luis Valley, where I started as a game warden in 1992, and then was in that position until 2000. And what were your supervisory duties, research duties, interaction with wildlife um, work tasks when you were an area wildlife manager in the San Luis Valley? So the area manager's job is to translate uh, the Division of Wildlife's mission statements and, and management strategies, long-term management strategies, 
into plans of action in your local geographic area. In the case of the Denver West, it was all that area west of Golden down to about Douglas County, um, up west of Boulder, uh, included an awful lot of um, dealings with city councils, county commissioners, as well as the wildlife commission at the time. And in the San Luis Valley, it covered the entire San Luis Valley from the headwaters of the Rio Grande all the way to the state line and all the way up to the spine of the Sangre de Cristos. Um, while I was in Denver, uh, the Division of Wildlife Experience had to go through its first uh, ever mountain lion fatality in the attack on Scott Lancaster. We had no policies at the time in terms of how to deal with a human, uh, an attack by a mountain lion on a person that resulted in a fatality. And as a consequence, we developed an entire education strategy for the western part of Denver, which eventually was adopted um, statewide, as well as the response plans for dealing with the communities, um, dealing with families, investigating the actual attack. Um, so. And when you use the term wildlife manager, manage wildlife, what are you talking about? What kind of animals are you talking about? What does it mean to manage wild life? Well, it means managing all of the wildlife within your assigned area or in your assigned district. So it includes all of the aspects from, as a district wildlife manager, it included getting in the helicopter and conducting um, helicopter surveys and censuses of both deer, elk, um, pronghorn antelope, occasionally bighorn sheep, surveys of bald eagle roost sites, surveys of duck and geese, um, wintering populations in the San Luis Valley. In the area west of Denver, it included, um, or excuse me, west of, west of Colorado Springs, it included Pikes Peak and one of the most historic bighorn sheep herds in the state of Colorado. And uh, as a district wildlife manager there, I developed a survey methodology that's actually still being used today and provides us one of the longest databases that we've had on any of our big one sheep populations. Um, kind of proud of that one. I guess I'll give myself a pat on the shoulder. And if you could please uh, recite for the jury in the, in the court your responsibilities when you got promoted to terrestrial section, carnivore biologist, and ranching for wildlife mm -hmm. coordinator from 2000 to 2017. So um, 2000 to 2017, about that time, I had decided that I had had enough of supervision and herding cats, and I looked forward to the opportunity to, to do more wildlife biology work. And uh, I was fortunate to um, test for and be offered the position of terrestrial section manager in charge of bears and lions, there was also a ranching for wildlife program element, and I'm not gonna explain too much about that, but the, the terrestrial section carnivore biologist is what they called me. Um, and my responsibility was to establish and promote a statewide program for the conservation of all our carnivores. Um, for the smaller mesocarnivores, there really wasn't all that much involved because there isn't a lot of information. The seasons are, at the time, were fairly wide open. And I'm uh, sorry for interrupting. I want you to go on. Can you explain to the jury what a mesocarnivore is? Um, I'm sorry. Uh, mesocarnivores are actually the, the technical definition of a mesocarnivore is any carnivore that has 50 to 75, 70% 70 of its diet being meat and the rest being vegetable matter, plant matter. Um, so a lot of people think of foxes and coyotes as carnivores and they are, they primarily eat meat, but they also eat a lot of other things with foxes. A lot of times they're eating insects and snakes and lizards. Um, they're also eating plant matter. They'll dig up tubers and eat prairie, prairie primrose. Um, coyotes will eat, I mean, literally virtually anything, and it depends on where they're at. Um, if you happen to be a coyote in Rocky Ford, you eat a fair amount of melons and melon season comes around. Um, so that's a, that's a mesocarnivore. 
And then my responsibilities also included the large carnivores. And what do you, give us some examples of large carnivores that you were managing. So mountain lion and bear, those are the only really large carnivores in Colorado. Occasionally we had sightings of wolves when I was working. They hadn't established themselves in the state of Colorado yet. And occasionally I would get reports of grizzly bears uh, in the South San Juan. Those never really penned up anything. You'd be surprised how many black bear photos I looked at over my career. And what's your educational background in, in biology that presumably suits you for this line of work? I have a bachelor's degree in wildlife, wildlife science from Colorado State University. And over the course of, of 38 years of working for the state of Colorado, can you recite a few awards and accommodations that you were given for your service? Oh, I think I told you before that I'm going to be terrible at this. But, um, if you need to refresh your recollection, uh, you're Of course, you're remember the primary motivation for my work. Um, I think the first award that I received was in 1985 from the Department of Army. I think they actually called it a presidential award, but it was from the Department of Army helping them work with product management program. And, at Fort Carson. Um, I received a lot of awards for outstanding performance, dedication, and professionalism throughout the 19, excuse me, 1980s. Um, 1991, I received an award from the division for professionalism under fire. That was for dealing with the, the investigation and the resulting um, mountain lion uh, fatality response strategy. Um, I received an award from Dylan Robbins, PC, one of the um, state's most recognized water attorney practices in the state for the partnership that we had developed in the San Luis Valley. The division owned a lot of water rights when I was the supervisor down there, and, and so I had to manage an awful lot of those water rights in, in concert with a whole lot of other entities from farmers to the municipalities in the San Luis Valley and, and Helen Robbins, BC, recognized the efforts that I put forward at that time. I was uh, awarded the, the Wildlife Society as the Society of All of the Professional Wildlife Managers, Wildlife Biologists, and Researchers in the state of Colorado. And it's, there's a national organization as well, but I received an award for the professional wildlife professional of the year in 1996. In 2012, the Colorado Trappers Association gave me an award for uh, wildlife professional of the year. And can you recite what, if any, management plans you've written and published for the state of Colorado as well? So I. Um, my responsibility was not to write management plans for most species. That responsibility lay with the area biologists and the, and the area managers. But my responsibility in the terrestrial section was to provide the outside parameters for how to develop those management plans, what data needed to be analyzed, how it needed to be analyzed um, to determine what our management strategies going forward would be. The exception to that is um, the mountain lion plan. Uh, we, we initially tried to have mountain lion plans sort of predicated on these distinct geographic areas, kind of the way we do deer, elk planning, bear planning as well. But it became evident pretty early in my activities as carnivore biologist that mountain lions are very different than a lot of the species in the state and they live at huge huge scales and a lot of our um, what we were calling data analysis units lion management units were we, we had lions living way larger than those entire units and so it really didn't make sense to, to manage on that basis so i began drafting uh, what ultimately has become the state's first almost statewide management plan for mountain lions. It's actually, they, they, it was in draft form when I finally retired. I, I gave up trying to get it passed. And uh, my predecessor came in and he took that management plan and then put it into place for 
the western part of the state. So now they approve the management plan for the western part of the state. And in all these roles of, of managing wildlife, managing carnivores, have you been able to see miso carnivores and large carnivores in the field doing their thing? Yes. And is there any way to estimate the dozens, hundreds, thousands of hours you've spent observing these animals in the field? And if you can't, you can't. Oh, thousands of hours. Okay. Yep. Thousands, maybe. Your Honor, at this time, I'd move to qualify and offer uh, Mr. Jerry Apker as an expert in wildlife biology, uh, carnivore biology, wildlife management in the state of Colorado. Any objection? Good afternoon, Mr. Apker. Any objection? No, Judge. Thank you. What was the third category, though? I heard wildlife biology. I heard carnivore biology. What was the third? Wildlife management. No objection. Okay. He'll be accepted as an expert of those areas. In uh, Mr. Apker, I, I want to talk about where you did the, the vast majority of your work in this, this context, and I understand that to be the San Luis Valley. Is that correct? Well, I, I lived and worked out of the San Luis Valley. I was district manager down there first for three years, area manager for eight years, and, and then I, I was in the terrestrial section for the remainder of my career from 2000 until 2017. But I had statewide responsibilities and traveled all over the state. And for, for those who don't know who haven't been there, can you describe the geography and ecology of the San Luis Valley and how, if at all, it differs from the San Juans here in this part of the state? Well, the western part of the San Luis Valley is not substantially different than the San Juans. In fact, it shares the San Juan National Forest, limited wilderness area is in San Juan National Forest. It's, it's, a large portion of it is in the San, what's considered the San Luis Valley, it's the upper Rio Grande, but it's a montane area. Um, and the valley itself is a high mountain park. The elevation is about 7,000, 7,500 feet. It's pretty flat all the way across the valley, but the, all of the areas around it, Sangre de Cristos, all the way up north to Ponch Pass and then over to uh, Wolf Creek Pass. It's all montane. And safe to say that the species that do their thing and live in the San Luis Valley are the same species that live in the San Juans and in, in the Vallecito area here in this part of the state as well? Yes. Okay. And can you describe for the court, based upon your expert opinion, uh, what animal scavenging is? And if you can confine your answer to scavenging by carnivores. Uh, scavenging by carnivores is simply the utilization of an already dead carcass for its food resource. And based upon your experience watching animals in the field, uh, what kind of animals, what species um, practice scavenging? All of the carnivore species practice scavenging. Um, how about rodents, birds as well? Well, Rodents, to the extent of that they might gnaw on bones and stuff in order to obtain calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, manganese, those kinds of minerals. Um, birds scavenge, but not all birds are scavengers. Um, jays, crows, the corvids, obviously vultures, and, and um, the raptors will scavenge on a carcass. Magpies, too? Magpies are corvids. Oh, yes. Oh. Thank Sorry. you. Sorry. No, that's, that's. And can you describe, focusing on, on carnivores, what kind of damage a carnivore can do to a carcass, to soft tissue and bones, based upon you, what you've observed, what you've seen in the field? Right. Well, um, so probably would have to characterize that a bit differently between the different carnivores. Um, theirs are probably the most notorious, sloppy scavengers, they'll grab hold of a carcass and, and even in relatively advanced stages of decomposition, things that would almost make most people throw up um, and just begin to kind of pull them apart and tear them apart and stuff gets strewn all over, they're, they're tearing it, whatever shoulder meat, they're pulling the hide back. Um, so that's a, that's a bear, a black bear. Um, mountain lions 
uh, comparatively, both in terms of scavenging as well as in terms of predation, um, are, are the most probably fastidious in terms of their behavior, and, and they will um, less frequently drag a scavenged carcass very far, but they'll drag it a little ways underneath some shrubs and stuff, and then they'll take a meal. And then after having taken a meal, then they'll scratch grass and dirt and stuff up over the carcass. Many of you have cats. You, you may have seen that kind of behavior in cats. They, cats do the same kind of thing when you scratch over. How about meso carnivores, including coyotes? So meso carnivores, oftentimes they're um, taking a meal. They're opportunistic, and so they're taking a meal just whenever or wherever they can find a carcass, whether that be a domestic stock or a large ungulate that's died, you know, either roadkill or wounding loss or just died of old age. Um, they'll take their meal, and, and a lot of meso carnivores won't really get an opportunity to take too much of a meal because other carnivores are, have, have um, taken advantage of the carcass. Um, so oftentimes the carcass is in a, a more advanced state of decomposition um, and bones have become disarticulated from one another and, and so they'll grab bones and stuff and pull them away and chew on them, hide and, and chew on them. And that's what you mean when you say disarticulate? Like pulling. Um, just, uh, so any joint is an articulation in a body, whether it be a person's body or whether it be in a, uh, a uh, elk carcass or anything like that. A joint is an articulation, and disarticulation is when the joint just is, doesn't stay together anymore. It gets pulled apart and they get scattered about. And based upon your expertise, are there certain times a year that any of these carnivores you've talked about, bears, mountain lions, coyotes, that they're more likely to scavenge during certain parts of years, or is it just on 365? So, um, yeah, coyotes will scavenge any time of the year um, because they're out and active and about um, all times of the year. Lions are active all times of the year, but at least in the research, the majority of, um, of lion scavenging seems to occur in the winter months, and it, and it seems to be associated with the fact that deer and elk are concentrated during that time. Or they're more likely to encounter some kind of carcass um, during that time. Bears are in hibernation in the wintertime. It takes them a little bit of time for their digestion to get going after they emerge from hibernation, a little bit of time as they're ramping down and going into hibernation. So they're more likely to scavenge in the months of June, July, and August, and it begins tapering off in, in September and October. By usually by October 15th, any scavenging by bears is almost completely shut down, as most of them are moving into hibernation. And, and, and you, so let's stay on the, on the topic of, of bears here, um, and, and that's one of the species you, you've managed. Can you speak to the factors that contribute to when a bear goes into hibernation? Well, um, so first of all, um, although it's a, it's generally accepted that all bears hibernate, that's not exactly true. And in fact, in, for instance, in Tahoe and uh, several other places, including a couple of places in Colorado, um, bears have been documented to be active even in the winter time, particularly male bears. Um, but they're they're pretty lethargic and they don't do a whole, they're generally not taking a meal. Um, so they're, they're mostly inactive, even though they might be out and about, they're usually not eating. Um, hibernation is triggered by, by a lack of food and it's an eco, it's an evolutionary adaptation that bears developed to deal with winter time. Uh, there's not a lot of food available for black bears for a large, a large body bear that isn't particularly predaceous. Um, and so, you know, they, they, since they're eating mostly vegetation, there's not a lot of good nutrition in the vegetation in the wintertime. So that's what's evolutionarily resulted in bears utilizing hibernation as a means of, of 
dealing with the lack of winter forage. And is hibernation dependent on the individual bear, or are the bears all like, oh, it's this day to 12 o'clock, let's all go hibernate? Um, hibernation is different amongst different age and gender classes and, and reproductive status of bears. Um, going back to, to scavenging, I want to talk about, based upon your expertise, what's the largest distance radius that you've observed or aware of of a bear dispersing carcass remains? Um, the furthest that I'm aware of is about a quarter to a half a mile in a domestic sheep carcass situation. And where are you aware of that happening within the state of Colorado? That was up in northwest Colorado. I was involved in assisting on a, an investigation on a bear damage claim. There were about close to 30 sheep killed in one incident by a bear. And same question, different species. As far as dispersal of remains, mountain lions, what's the, the distance radius that a mountain lion will disperse, or drag remains, as you were described earlier today? The, the, and I only have really honestly one incident to base this on. Uh, but I know that most mountain lions will not take a carcass a very long distance. 100 yards, 200 yards in most circumstances. Um, there was a uh, llama that was killed by a mountain lion in a pen west of Boulder. It was actually up by Ward, I guess. Um, the mountain lion jumped into this pen, a six-foot fence around it, killed the, the llama, jumped out carrying the llama and drug it about a quarter of a mile, maybe as far as a half a mile up over a hill and stashed it underneath a ponderosa pine and took its several meals there. We, we actually traced that back. And, and I take it bears and mountain lions don't need to drag these materials that far because there's, there's no other species out there that are really going to try and usurp the, the material. That's, that's correct. And when we're talking about usurpation of, of remains, what does that mean? Uh, usurpation is usually when uh, a, a smaller animal um, that's scavenging or has killed them, made a kill, and a larger or more aggressive or larger numbers of that animal come along and usurp that kill or that dead carcass. And in the, I'll give you an example of when I say more animals in the Yellowstone area, wolves usurping kills by lions is relatively common. It's also one of the reasons we think evolutionarily that mountain lions tend to fear canids um, because wolves tended to be more aggressive towards mountain lions and mountain lion kills. In, also in Yellowstone, grizzly bears usurping kills of or, or a scavenged carcass by black bear has been noted and really common. Here in Colorado, we don't have those, well, I should say an exception because since I retired, we now have a, a pack of wolves apparently in Jackson County and North Park. Um, but I never had to deal with the experiences of, of observing wolves, grizzly bears usurping carcasses and bears and lions appear to utilize the landscape. Black bears and lions appear to utilize the landscape differently. So they don't usurp carcasses usually from one another. How about from coyotes? They can from coyotes easily. And safe to say, when we're talking about all these species, coyotes, mountain lions, bears, um, when they're hunting, scavenging, traveling, are they trying to maximize efficiency? <laughs> Um, energy efficiency, yes. Yes, and explain to the jury what you mean by energy efficiency. So um, there's there's three driving factors that really affect um, animal behaviors. One is predator avoidance. One is food gathering, and the third is reproduction. Those are the three things that really motivate animals. And then all that, the thing that's really most important, or one of the things that's really important to them is conserving energy because you never know when you're going to get your next meal when you're a wild animal. So conserving energy um, is very important. And, that, and the only real exception to that is in terms of reproductive behaviors. Oftentimes it's worth 
expending extravagant amounts of energy in order to be able to reproduce in the wild. Um, but in terms of food gathering and predator avoidance, animals always operate with, with a, and I hate to use the word mindset because that's, wild animals are not people, and, um, but their, their operation is always to conserve energy to the degree they can. And, and you said a couple of concepts there I want to fo follow up on. You said you're hesitant to use the word mindset and that, that wild animals are, are not people. As a wildlife biologist, as someone who's managed wildlife, managed carnivores, can you identify general trends and generalized behavior in these species we've been talking about today? Um, and I'm not talking about scavenging or anything like that, but is it possible to identify just in general what general behaviors are for species? Oh, yes, it is. And when we're talking about generalized behaviors of wild animals, are there some individuals in those species that don't conform to those generally observed behaviors? Um, yes, and I, I think maybe I can give you an example. Um, in my career, I, I think I've probably trapped close to 75 and maybe 80 bears, maybe a little more than that. But, um, and, you know, we have to trap as a wildlife officer or as an area supervisor, we've had to, and even in the carnivore, as a carnivore biologist, I assisted field officers in trapping situations. Um, we have to trap and move them when they get into conflicts. Um, and we have a two strike policy and I, I, I almost am ashamed to take honor of, of having helped write the two strike policy because it's always controversial. But um, in that process of trapping that number of bears, I have seen the behavior of bears behaving like puppy dogs in a trap that you, you could literally probably have reached your hand into the, the jab ports and petted it on its head and it would have cowered away from you in, that, in doing that. I've also had bears where you were almost afraid to even walk up to the bear trap because they were just roaring and knocking at the sides. And, and when you tried to, to jab them, I had one of them grab the jab bowl after I stuck it and actually snapped the jab pole in half with just biting it. So they can become really aggressive or they can be behave uh, very shyly. The vast majority of them tended to just kind of cower away from you in the trap. And so it, you, know, you can take that same kind of behavior and translate it into the wild. Um, some bears are more aggressive than other bears. Generally males tend to be more aggressive than females. Um, but most bears, for instance, with humans, in, in a face-to-face -face situation, most of the time bears will run away from you. And, and you're describing one example of one type of behavior in, in a species, if I'm understanding you correctly. That's correct. And this, this dynamic that, there's, that you can't apply <laughs> certain rules and certain known behaviors to all the individuals in a particular species, is that, is that an accurate statement? Yeah, yes, it is. Um, I want to go back to dispersal of remains because there's one species we didn't talk about, and that's, that's coyotes. Based upon your observations, based upon your management plans, based on what you've read and researched, what do you know about the range that coyotes in Colorado can disperse remains? Uh, well, so coyotes have home areas that generally vary between about less than five square miles to all the way up to 40, about 40 square miles in the state of Colorado. And it usually is driven by the amount of prey available. Real prey rich environments, they can have really, really small home areas. In, in relatively prey poor locations, they can have really large home areas. Now, in terms of the amount of dispersal or distance of dispersal from an actual carcass, um, there's no hard and fast set rules um, for how far they can di disperse a carcass. Um, I can tell you that having worked pronghorn hunting season on the eastern plains, 
an area where there's lots of visibility and uh, you know I, for those of you that have live in a mountainous area if you've never lived on the eastern plains there's this sort of imagination that the eastern plains are as flat as this tabletop here and that's not exactly true there's an awful lot of hills and dales and valleys and and little areas, and especially in southeastern Colorado, you have the Purgatory Canyon, and you have lots of little canyon feeders that feed into the Purgatory Canyon. And I sat up on the edge of the rim watching, looking for uh, pronghorn hunters and watched a, a uh, coyote. I was carrying a long bone, and it was either the, like the rib bone of a cow or might have been a leg bone of a, of a deer or an elk. And... And it carried that thing for probably a half a mile before I finally lost it, dropping down into the Purgatory Canyon. Is it possible for coyotes or, or meso carnivores to carry skeletal remains a, a mile and a half or more? Well, I think it would be possible, yeah. Possible. And that's possible? Sounds like there's a second part to that answer. Is that a typical behavior of, of meso carnivores or coyotes? I don't think it would be typical. I mean, I can't explain why the coyote was carrying a long bone like that. I mean, for, the only rational explanation I had in my head was it must be carrying it somewhere, someplace where it feels safe, it's going to hunker down, and it's going to chew on the end because it needs calcium or it needs phosphorus. That's how wild animals respond. If they need certain types of nutrition, they seek out either the plants or the animals that, that have that, that nutritional element they seem to be lacking. And that was the only thing that I could come up with. And if a coyote were to carry skeletal remains a mile and a half or, or greater, again, that analysis of energy efficiency comes into discussion, safe to say? Yes. And, and how do those two concepts jive with one another? Well, to me, in my mind, what you're, what you're getting at is they might carry a bone a certain distance, but it has to be because they they need the energy or they're avoiding other prey or other predators in order to find a secure spot to then gnaw on whatever it is or chew on whatever it is that they're carrying around. And, Your Honor, I'd ask to approach the witness with what's been previously marked, but it's not on your chart, Your Honor, and I apologize for that as defendant 1921. Mm -hmm. I would love you that. You may. Drafter, do you know what, what this is and, and what it's portraying? Well, it's a topographic map, and I can see portions of uh, Womenich Wilderness is defined in that area. And do you know how to read a topographical map? And yeah, in terms of uh, the contour lines and whatnot, yes. And does this map appear to be a fair and accurate representation of these portions of the Womenich Wilderness? Yes. I'd move to admit defendant one nine two one. No objection, Your Honor. Admitted. Turn it more towards the jury. I don't need to see it as much as they do. Oh. Can you see Mr. Johnson? <clears throat> yes, Your Honor. All right. Check. Push it back or move. Right. I'm going to ask him to stand up. Right. I'm with you. And actually, go ahead and stand up, Mr. Rafter, and take a gander here. I'm going to point out a few features on the, the map, and then I'm going to ask, ask you a question. Um, safe to say, where I'm pointing here appears to be the Valisito campground, correct? And it's labeled as much. The way this has got to work, the way this works, i got to hand you the, the microphone. And so I'm going to let 
And would you agree there's there's also what appears to be a road that kind of snakes up this way, crosses Bear Creek, gets really close to Bear Creek again, winds up, comes back down, and comes down into an area that's labeled as runlet park. It looks like it's labeled for service road 724. And my question for you is based upon your expertise, observing carnivores in the field, managing carnivores, being familiar with coyote behavior, is it possible for a coyote to carry remains or skeletal remains from this area here on the road? This area here on the road by Bear Creek, up and over the ridge line, and down into Runlet Park, or really anywhere along this road between these two switchbacks here. Well, okay, so I'm looking at Runlet Park, anywhere between 10.4 and 10.6 elevation. Yeah. Yeah. Or even yeah. below that as well. Okay, 10,000 feet. Mr. Edgar, you can stand off the side a little more so we can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so Runlet Park and the elevation here is anywhere between 10,000 and 10,6. Um, and you said from over about here? This stretch is road 724. Okay, well, let's just take the lowest elevation. You're talking about somewhere between 9,200 feet. To 10 to a thousand feet of elevation gain, a coyote would never go in a straight line right up and over a ridge. It would probably side hill along the ridge and then up into the area. So it's actually probably more than a mile and a half distance wise. But that's entirely possible for that to, I mean, physically they can scan. There's no problem with that. So, Coyote wouldn't go straight up and straight down, but it's possible for a coyote to take remains from this section of the road to run the park. They have that capability. Yes, yeah, it would it could go either way, either up and over around this way or over around this way. And the, the elevation is fine for a coyote. I've seen coyotes up in the mountain. It's fine if it's fine if he leaves it up, Judge. It's not fine with me. Oh, I, I understand. It. Might be putting it back up then. And, and that's fine. You can do it when when you're ready. Thank you. Now, I think if I understand what you're saying, you wouldn't consider this to be typical behavior of a coyote to carry skeletal remains that far. No, I wouldn't. But you're not excluding that as possible behavior as a coyote, if I understand you correctly. No, I'm, I mean, honestly, I'm, I almost, at this point, I'm retired, but at this point in my career, I almost don't discount any behavior. I mean, I know that we have wild animals. You always sort of say, this is the normal and typical behavior. Well, Normal and typical for black bears is to have a litter of one or two, maybe three cubs. But I know it's been documented in the eastern United States as well as in Utah and California. Bears have had as many as six cubs. So, you know, normal and typical behavior, that, that's a physiological, beha physiological function. Um, so in terms of behaviors, I would expect behaviors to be even more diverse. So is it is it um, normal for a coyote to carry a bone a long distance? No, it's not really normal, but is it possible? Certainly is possible, but I can't give you probabilities or anything like that. And, and if I understand correctly, you're unaware of any hard and fast rules as to how far a coyote would, would carry skeletal remains. Yeah, I'm not aware of any kind of research or documentation. Nothing further, Judge. Mr. Jensen? Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. So 
Judge, may I approach and put the mask yeah. back up? Thanks. You can. So, sir, with the map in mind, um, and we'll talk about specifically in a minute, um, it's possible that a bear could carry a skull that far too physically, right? Yes. And it's possible that a mountain lion could carry a skull that far physically, right? Uh, physically, yes. Have you ever seen anything like that in your career? Uh, bears and lions, no. And I'm not aware of, I've never seen a coyote carry anything that far in my career. The furthest you've seen is a half mile? About a half a mile. Yeah. Okay. And you were able to see that because you were out on a flatter, uh, more like the plains, right? Well, it was the plains, but it was the Purgatory Canyon area. That's okay. so it was. It was hilly? It, it, well, yeah. I mean, I was sitting on the edge of a vertical cliff that was maybe 400 feet straight drop, sandstone country, and I was watching the coyote across the Purgatory Canyon. Um, on the other side. Going across the, the ground of the canyon? It was moving across um, some ledges, dropped down into a little draw, climbed up over another little draw, dropped over another little draw, and then it peeked down and dropped into the tamarisk in the bottom of the Purgatory River basin, and I lost it there. Okay. So fair to say it was within your sight for that half mile? Yeah. Because there wasn't a whole lot of cover for the coyote to get to at the bottom. That's right. I was watching it through a spotting scope. And so it's a very different, even if it's hilly and had some uh, cliff, it's very different terrain than we're talking about on Middle Mountain Road, right? It, well, yeah, it's um, eastern plains, um, pinion, or pinion juniper forest, if you could even call it forest scrubland, um, and then down into the purgatory riparian area. This is all montane. Right. So no deadfall. That's and, correct. And no uh, forestry and cover like that. That's correct. Okay. And then when we talk about the map here, may I approach you? Yes. Before I approach the map, have you ever been to Middle Mountain Road? No. Not, never? Never. As far as I recall. I've flown over it, but I've flown over that country, but... Okay. Okay. So you didn't go to the Red Wine residence in this house to look at what the terrain was like there? No. And you didn't go to the remain site or the skull site to look at what the terrain was like there? No. All right. But we have the map. We'll talk about the map. Um, may I approach your You may. So you talked about... Um, can you see, sir? Let's let, let the jury see too. Can you step off the yes, side right. or the other? So you talked about uh, th this is about 1,500 vertical feet from the base of the road up and another 500 down. Does that sound about right? So give me the starting point. Right on. Uh, this would be Middle Mountain Road, and we would be down about here on Middle Mountain Road going over this ridge line here into Runlet Park down towards the bottom. That's, that's the point. Okay. Thank you, sir. And assuming that there's dead fall in here and it's thick woods, assuming that, um, you're saying a coyote wouldn't even take this route that would be the mile and a half at the cell fire. So let's assume this coyote uh, that we've never seen, or would you agree with me, isn't really in any studies or literature? Okay, let's talk about the hypothetical coyote. The hypothetical coyote you, you think is probably going to find a way around, like uh, somewhere around here. Would you like to show the jury what route you think might be most logical? So, sir, if we're talking a mile and a half right here, we're talking almost double that if the, if the coyote's going around. 
Okay. And on that two to three miles, just by looking at the map, uh, you'd agree with me there's still a lot of woods and dead fall, et cetera. Let's stick with the hypothetical coyote that's going three miles with a skull. This is going to be, let's hypothetically say this is stick with uh, woods and dead fall. That coyote's going to consider that kind of thing before it takes that action, right? If you want to grab a seat, I'll talk from the lectern. Can you take that down again, please? Unless you need it. So when we talk about that coyote, whether it's going to continue to carry it, there are factors we can consider, right, that the coyote might consider? Sure. And we're talking about a nutrition to energy balance. That's correct. And this is the way all wildlife makes decisions, correct? Right. So if a coyote's considering whether to go three miles with a skull over deadfall in trees, might one consideration be how much nutritional value is actually in that bone? That, that's true. And might one consideration be if there's a place closer that that coyote can get cover and eat that bone? I, I think they would consider that, okay. depending upon how far they're in their home range. How right. safe they feel within that area. And might the coyote consider the amount of energy it's going to expend to cover that terrain with that item to get where it's going? Well, sure. It's all, like I said, it's all an energy balance type equation. Okay. We talked about, uh, or Defense Council talked about bears. Um, is it accurate mm -hmm. to say that you've seen bears typically within a quarter mile dispersal pattern when they are scavenging? Yeah, a quarter to half a mile. You've never seen it out to a mile and a half? No. And lions are less? They're 100 to 200 yards? Yeah, I, with the exception of that one predation event, um, the, the, the furthest I've ever even tracked back from a dead carcass to where we think the kill site was, 100 yards. Okay. And they cache their prey, right? They'll take the whole body and cache it under something. That's where they'll feed, and then they're done. Yeah. And when we're talking about bears, uh, you know Heather Johnson personally, right, Dr. Johnson? Yes. And you're aware of her study up in the area in the winter of 2012? Mm -hmm. And you'd agree that the bears in the area in 2012 were hibernating by November 15th of that year? Yes. And you'd agree by October 15th, they're not really feeding anymore? They're slowing down. They've slowed, slowed down a lot, yes. So when we're talking about a bear uh, in Tahoe that maybe doesn't hibernate, for example, is that a pretty uh, unlikely and unusual example? Well, yeah, that's very unusual for a male bear not to hibernate. Okay. And it's even more unusual for a male bear not hibernating to be feeding. Right. Because in the winter, they're shut down even if they're not hibernating. Right. So that would limit the likelihood of a bear either dragging food or, or any kind of kill at that point in time. Yeah, in the wintertime, I would say a bear doing that kind of thing would be almost the rarest circumstance I've ever seen. Okay. And we talked about a few of the rarest circumstances today, right? Sure. In terms of mountain lions, we, you gave the jury the, the most unusual example you've seen where it carried a llama of a half mile. That's correct. And we gave the jury the most unusual scenario you've seen where a coyote carried a skull or I'm sorry, it was a bone, right? A long, long bone. bone. Yeah, it was a half mile. About a half mile. And you'd agree with me that a coyote's going to prefer a long bone or something like that to a skull, for example. Yes. And we talked about the most extreme or the most unlikely and unusual example of a bear in Tahoe, right? Yes. Okay. Um, but coming back to normal animal behavior, um, you wouldn't expect any of these animals in the wilderness, especially in terrain like that, to pick up a human skull and carry it the distance that we were just talking on that map, would you? It would not be expected. Okay. And I think you used terms uh, when we previously talked that it'd be unusual, an outlier, or not typical behavior. Does that sound right to you? That's correct.
Thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Redirect. Tell me. Let's talk about the most famous coyote ever from Purgatory Canyon. <laughs> You were unable to watch how far that coyote took that bone because it disappeared from sight, correct? Yes, that's correct. So you and you saw it carry that that bone at, at least a half mile, right? It was it was carrying it a half mile from the from the moment I saw it. It was carrying the bone from the moment it disappeared from vision. It was carrying the bone, and that distance was about a half mile. And and you've already testified how animals can take remains from one another, correct? Yes all with their own range of how far they'll carry or disperse something, safe to say. Well, I guess um, maybe I ought to clarify. I, I'm not aware of like a bear taking a bone from a coyote. I've never seen that behavior. Right. But usurpation of a carcass of a kill site, um, I, I know that has occurred. I've seen um, video uh, support of that happening in other places. I've never actually observed usurpation take place in the state of Colorado, but I know it happens. And as far as the, the start date of hibernation, the bears don't all get together and say we're all hibernating on this specific date. That's an estimated start date for a certain sector of the bear population, safe to say. Well, actually, I mean, what I gave you was the, was the sort of mean for all bears and i know that you know there's there's differences in terms of den entry and den exit date mean mean den entry and mean den exit date for different um, genders and reproductive status bears uh, they have different timing but on average uh, most bears have really begun to shut down and stop feeding by about october 15th and most bears are in the den by November 15th. Right, and that that's a, those are median average dates, so there's outliers before and after those dates. Yeah, well. it would be a bell curve, and there's some that enter earlier, and then there's some that enter much later. And that, that feeds into the, the larger concept is there are not black letter rules for animal behavior. Well, in terms of black letter rules, yes, there's, there's, there is not hard and fast rules for animal behavior. Not better put. Okay. Nothing further, Judge. Any questions from the jury? Can this witness be excused? By all means. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Chapter. You're free to go. Thank you, sir. Uh-huh. Your next witness? Uh, Dr. Ha. And depending how long we go, I thought we'd at least get through qualifications before a break. I thought that might be a good time to break it, unless you think something different. Is two years, Mr. Murray? Yes. Would that be seem appropriate? Yes. Okay. Dr. Hawk, come up to the witness stand up here, please. And if you would raise your right hand before you sit down. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Have a seat. Okay. May I inquire? You may. Good afternoon, Professor. Would you please state your name and spell your last name for the record? My name is James Craig Ha. Last name is H A. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Um, I wanted, well, I'm going to ask the judge to qualify you as an expert in zoology, animal behavior, animal sensing systems and including canines, which is the bulk of what I'll be asking you about today. Um, in fact, all of what I'll be asking you about today. So to do that, I need to go over your educational employment history, the works. So the, the exciting part first. Um, and this isn't the time to be shot. So may I ask, have you ever done any teaching? And if so, most recently, what was it? I, I have been. I have been teaching since I've been at the University of Washington as a faculty member since 1990. And most recently, I've developed an online 
uh, academic program in applied animal behavior, which has to do with dog and cat behavior. And I've been teaching that for the last uh, eight years. Does uh, interest in science and animals run in your family? It does. It does. I'm often asked how I got started studying animal behavior, and it's an easy answer because my dad was an animal behaviorist, and in fact, my grandfather was an animal behaviorist. So, biologists and people studying animals go way back in my family. So, when other little kids wanted to grow up to be ninjas and soldiers and the rest, yes, the, the story is in fifth grade. I was asked, as it was the whole class, what you want to be when you grow up, and there were firemen and police and maybe lawyers or something, and, and I said I wanted to be a PhD biologist. Um, so you have an undergraduate degree? I do, biology from Millersville University. And did you graduate with honors or distinction? I did, I graduated um, with departmental honors. Yes. Scholarship, the rest of it? Yes. Um, did you then have to get a master's degree? I did get a master's degree at Wake Forest University in, again, in biology. Okay. And then later went on to study and obtain a PhD. Right. I have a PhD uh, in 1989 from Colorado State University. Um, and what was it in? That was in zoology. Thank you. And I, the judge reminds me, um, I, I want to narrow this and make sure that zoology is something that's applicable to an understanding of canine behavior, mm -hmm. is it? Right. So animal behavior specifically is a subfield of, of biology or specifically zoology, which studies animals rather than plants. Um, and so um, my specialty all through all of those academic programs was in animal behavior. There is no such thing as a PhD in animal behavior. It's in biology, um, but with a focus in animal behavior training. And, um, and indeed, then I've gone on to obtain education and certification to become even more specialized in animal behavior science um, so that I am now a certified applied animal behaviorist. And being an applied animal behaviorist means I have the background to help people deal with issues in, with animals in the world around us, um, livestock, zoo animals, most commonly dogs and cats. Okay. So on the, on the one hand, we have understanding animals in and of themselves, and the zoology part of it, but also the applied part is how humans interact with them. That's, that's correct. That's understand? correct. Or how, how humans impact animals, or how animals impact humans, or and the, the human animal um, bond, whether that's detection dogs, or therapy dogs, or really badly behaved dogs in your house, or, or whatever. Okay. Um, let me ask what emeritus professor means, if I may. You're emeritus research professor? Right. I spent my career as what's called in the research professor track at the University of Washington. This means I was primarily focused in research and providing my own salary funds through my own research grants and so on. Uh, my primary focus was not in teaching, although I personally enjoyed teaching, so I did a lot of it. Um, and so I worked my way through the research professor track. So I was an assistant research professor and then promoted to associate research professor and then promoted to a full research professor um, and then retired in 2014, I believe. And at that point, um, the university no longer has an obligation to my salary, uh, but I keep all the rights and privileges of having students and teaching and, and so on and that's an emeritus position. So I am an emeritus research professor. Okay. Um, professor, have you taught about dogs? I have taught about dogs for years, decades. Okay. How about at the university level? At the university level, and that's the program that I'm, I specifically designed and um, currently teach is, is, is in applied animal behavior and almost the entire program is about dogs because that's where we have the most time. Any of those students that you work with specifically with dogs, graduate students, or is it primarily undergraduate? Oh, they're undergraduate students, they're graduate students. We have veterinarians that I teach, um, veterinary technicians. Um, uh, many of our students are overseas, so I have um, a judge from Chile who's in the program because they want to establish a program with 
dogs and helping in the courtroom. Um, so it's a, it's a very wide variety of people. Um, and your business, as I understand it, was something started, or, or maybe you were able to put more energy into it after you retired. Yes, yes. I started a consulting business sort of on the side of my faculty business, um, going in homes and helping people with dog and cat and parrot and weasel behavior issues, um, sort of on a one-on-one -on -one basis, mostly as a service for the local veterinarians who don't have a lot of behavior training. Um, so I ran that, and it was a great opportunity to teach students. So, um, uh, and I've been able to expand that consulting work. So that that work has now spread into since I retired. So the work is now spread into more consulting work, uh, expert legal witness work. I can uh, have or am consulting with several different academic programs on research uh, on on dogs right now. So expertise or doctorate in zoology lends itself to, well, that gives some understanding of animal behavior, and then that lends itself to teaching humans how to interact. Objection, these are leading questions. You have been, leading. That. You have been leading, so please. Um. Uh, does that help with, talk to me about how a doctorate in zoology helps them with an understanding of animal behavior and how to apply that to humans and how humans interact. So a degree in zoology um, gives you the broad background. In other words, the kind of education I have to get is in things like animal physiology, how the sensory system works, how the brain works, how hormones work, how the muscles work uh, in all kinds of animals. And, um, and, and likewise, I have background in course in evolutionary biology, I have a background uh, in, in sensory systems, you get into specialized courses in reproduction and genetics, and, and, and this is all covered, and we're covering it in zoology, so that means for all animals. Uh, my interests, of course, were particularly focused on the behavior part and how all these other zoology factors influence the behavior of an organism. And so I was particularly focused on how this, but this all had to do with behavior and took a large number of animal behavior courses as part of my zoology training. Um, and then of course you continue to learn as new research data comes out, you're staying up to date on the, on the research journals. So a lot of what a PhD in zoology gives you also is the background to be able to stay up to date with the latest research. And so, we like to say that you know we're a student forever <laughs> um, because we're always learning from the new research that's constantly coming out. Professor, are you up to date? I am very up to date, and one of the things I enjoy about teaching uh, is that you have to stay very up to date to to, to teach because if not, the students will catch up. May we approach this? Yes.
Uh, Dr. Hom, you were saying that you have kept up to date on research. And let me be more specific. Have you kept up to date with research that applies to handlers and working dogs? Yes. Um, have you received any research grants, and specifically as they relate to working dogs, handlers, that kind of stuff? Yes, I, I work, I consult for a couple of different organizations. So when you say working dogs, it's a broad term because there are many, many jobs for dogs. So I do a number of work and receive grants for work with um, courthouse facility dogs, um, the use of assistance dogs in the courtroom to support victims. Um, more specifically to the point here, I'm, I'm currently um, a co-principal investigator with Dr. Donnie Stedman at the University of uh, Tennessee Knoxville's uh, body farm and um, currently are designing and getting ready to prepare and to execute a uh, study on specifically on uh, cadaver dogs and the performance of validity of cadaver dog use. And that is a facility that Arpad Voss, Dr. Arpad Voss, is some association with? Oh, yes. He was addressed by one of the witnesses previous to your testimony today. So. Um, the University of Tennessee is where they're doing sort of the most groundbreaking. Or is it the only body farm in the country? No, it, it actually is not. Oh, okay. Creepily enough, there are a number of body farms. It's become a very uh, popular and important research project. And so uh, there are several other body farms around. University of Tennessee in Knoxville certainly has the first and the largest and the best funded and some of the most groundbreaking. That's the one I've come across. Yeah. So I got the idea. Okay. Um, so what yourself and uh, sorry, Dr. Stedman, yes. you're working on creating something that would validate and standardize the work human remains detection dogs and their handlers do? That's correct. And where is the funding for that coming from? That will come from the National Institute of Justice, the just U.S. Justice Department. Is that also referred to as the Department of Justice? Department of Justice. Um, and why are they funding that? Well, the, because there's a, a real um, shortage of research on dogs in general, I lecture often. Objection, I'd like to approach again, please. Well, I was waiting for your objection. I don't know that you need to. Are you going to go any further with this right now? No. All right. Does that take care of you for now? For now. All right. Um, have you ever spoken? at an annual convention or annual conventions for behavioral analysis related to dogs? I, I have. Okay. Have you spoken internationally with respect to or lectured on applied animal behavior relating to dogs? I have. I've traveled in Brazil and been invited by the government of Brazil to speak on this and um, also in Australia. Okay. Um, have you ever been published in zoology in general? I have. Have you been published in journals related to zoology and your understanding of dogs? I have. Have you been published in journals with respect to dogs and uh, their interaction with humans? I have. So journal articles respecting uh, dogs and handlers? Yes. Is that redundant? Pardon me if it was. Have you uh, published articles specifically related to dog behavior? I have. And those are peer reviewed? Yes, I, yes, I have. Can you tell the jury how many times you've given scientific presentations related to dogs? Uh, no. No. Uh, dozens, dozens, and uh, quite a large number, and I give them both at the, at the academic level as well as at the at the public level. Level, I have a public education program seminars that I give to owners through our local uh, shelter. Um, so I've given lots of lectures about dog behaviors all all over the world to lots of different levels of people. Have you presented and written with respect to canine cognition? Yes, I have. To whom? To whom? Uh, canine cognition to uh, uh, part of it was that international conference that you mentioned. I've given presentations at our national scientific organization, the Animal Behavior Society. Um, I just finished well, a little while ago. I finished my first book in dog behavior, and that certainly talks about about canine cognition uh, and sensory systems. 
Have you written books about dogs? I have. So I've just published my first book, and I'm delighted to say we just heard that it's being asked to be revised for second edition. Congratulations. Uh, so any other books that you've written, and then what were the topics? I have uh, a textbook in statistics of, of all the boring things, but, but a very well-reviewed statistics textbook, and we're, my wife and I are currently working on a second book on dogs and particularly in breed differences and what we know about the science or lack thereof of breed differences among dogs. Breed differences is important with respect to what we've been consulting with you on in this case, right? With um, among other things. I mean, we're looking at breed differences and what we know about breed differences in all dimensions of behavior of, of dogs. So uh, assistance dogs, home dogs, everything. So tied to the understanding of human remains. Gotcha. That's yeah. it's it's all right. leading to in four stamps. Okay. And with respect to qualifying a witness, leading questions are appropriate. Well, I, I, I'm, not so, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not so sure it is. But do you have much more? Judge, if, if the state hadn't indicated that the, a challenge is coming, I could have done this quickly. But I, I'm going to make sure that the door gets slammed shut. All right. Go ahead, but uh, I don't, part of the problem here is what we discussed this morning, and you're straying into things that I don't think are you're going to be able to go into, and that's what the, all the objections are about. Every single thing I'm talking about is included in the disclosure and the interview. That Certain we'll, things that you've talked about here, you're not going to be allowed to go into, so you could take it for that. You don't have to argue with me, um, there, and I'm not going to talk about it in front of the jury. Finish your qualification. Uh, professor, have you ever worked with the police with respect to dogs? Yes. The Federal Bureau of Investigation? Yes. Was that something that you included in your CV? Uh, no, I don't think so. Not at the time that my CV was submitted. Objection, Judge. This is the expert disclosure. This is the problem that I addressed with the court. Exactly this. Since this case... Since Stop. The, okay. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll get a longer break than we will. All right, we're going to give you guys a break, and then we're going to take a break, and then I hope we have some time for some evidence. So uh, I'm not sure how long it's going to be. I'm hoping it's not longer than 20, 25 minutes, but that could be way off. So take a recess. Please remember not to talk to each other about it. Okay, right, you here? Everybody be seated. I left uh, the stuff I read in the lunch All right, so Mr. Johnson, you're concerned or your objection is that there's things being disclosed now that weren't previously disclosed to you? Yes, Judge, I have several uh, issues, but I would ask that the doctor step out. I think the leading questions have been forcing a connection between handling and his resume or CV, and I'm concerned if he sits through the testimony, that'll be done even easier. Well, the questioning anyway. I think you should step down for a little bit and we'll, we'll call you when it's time. All right, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. So I tried to raise this issue long ago, and that's why I filed the pleadings, and that's why we have the order from the court. And all I ever really wanted was an updated CV, and I wanted a report with expert opinions and the basis thereof. And instead, I have that eight-page interview that I talked to Dr. Ha back in 2019. I have a CV. May I approach with a copy of the CV, Judge? Yes. The 
copy I've given you um, is the copy that I have, and I asked for it to be updated, and it wasn't. I've just been doing word searches for Body Farm, University of Tennessee, Department of Justice, FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation. None of that is in this CV. And so when I read this CV, I thought to myself, I don't think this person knows a single thing about canine handling. And that's going to be my position after this wadir as well. And I was surprised that he was actually the witness they chose to call in this instance. But because I have no discovery, because I don't have an updated CV, because I don't have a report, all of these things that are coming up are new. And I asked in advance so Mr. Moran could be organized and could provide those materials so we weren't in the situation we're in right now. And instead, he chose a different path. He chose the path of not providing those items, and we find ourselves in this situation where he's starting to talk about things the doctor's done that aren't in those materials. Now, Judge, I intend a lengthy voir dire with this individual to see if he knows anything about canine handling. But that aside, these are discovery violations, and the court has ruled that they're limited to that eight-page report, and I have the CV that I have right in front of you. If it's convenient, Judge, I've highlighted every section in there that uses the word dog, canine, or puppy, and there's not once that the word handler appears in that CV. And there's neither of these references counsel has just tried to shove in with leading questions. So, Judge, I'm going to object to this witness in the end, but right now I'm objecting to these topics in particular. Mr. Marin? Judge, I'm not going to dignify the personal attack, but this issue was addressed. And your Honor issued a very specific order. We complied, we complied with the order originally, and we complied with it based on what Your Honor wrote. We didn't need anything further than what was included in this interview, which talks about the FBI, which talks about Big Dog. It comes as no surprise to the prosecution that this witness is being called to address the issues that would be raised by what they told us was Katie Spielman, Karen Corcoran, and Ray Randolph. Um, that's what he's being called to do. He does have this understanding. I, I accept that some of the newest work that's come about as people have gotten vaccinated and COVID is sort of winding down, uh, that's when they started creating this program with uh, the University of Tennessee. So that's probably fair. I can move off of that. It's work that's done since the disclosure and order was made by Your Honor. Um, but. Absent that, the notion that Dr. Ha is a surprise to Mr. Johnson. Well, that's not, that's not what he's saying. He's well, saying with what he's to, saying is he's entitled to have notice and a report, which he never did, so he ended up doing this interview as to what he's going to testify about. And so you know, it's going to be difficult for me to make rulings. You know, I'm going to have to go back through this um, as the uh, testimony is going, but that's what the argument is. It's, it's it's not that he didn't know about Dr. Ha. We've known about Dr. Ha for quite a while. Right. And, and Mr. Johnson made this same specious argument in a pleading filed with well, Your Honor. If, you, if you're not going to respond to personal attacks, please don't make any, okay? So the a specious argument is a personal attack. So just... I, I say that with the support of the fact that there was a pleading filed with Your Honor saying that they didn't have any notice of Dr. Ha. That wasn't true. There had been a disclosure provided by the defense. It provided Dr. Haw's information. It provided what we expected him to talk about. And then Dr. Haw, different than your, your Honor will recall with former Officer Corcoran, who would not speak with us, Dr. Haw made himself available for a lengthy interview with the prosecution. And what's contained in that interview, what's contained in his CV, and what's contained in my disclosure is wide enough that we can cover the topics necessary. But also, and importantly, he's being called to rebut the testimony provided by the prosecution witnesses. And to argue that they're not on notice of the things that would be brought to bear by this witness to challenge their witnesses who have lower qualifications, I believe to be, I, I, the only word that's coming to mind is specious, and I, I'm sorry if that sounds like a personal attack, but that's where we're at. That's what we're calling him for. He is eminently qualified. I, I welcome a, a voir dire examination on this. Um, so I, if there's any further record, I'm happy to make it. What we're going to do at this point is I want you to request that you qualified as an expert when the jury comes back. I want Mr. Johnson to do his voir dire. If you feel the need, you can, you can do more. Sure. 
and uh, then we'll see what I decide. So is this a copy for the court? Or you may have it, Your Honor. That's fine. We need to mark it as a court exhibit, I believe. We probably need to mark, which I've written on now, unfortunately, <coughs> um, the investigative report as a court exhibit also. Can, at some point, can I get a clean version of the investigative support so that my marks aren't on it? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And we'll mark those both as court exhibits for the record. May I inquire what hold, they hold on, are? Seven and eight. One is the report, uh, Chuck Heidel's report. Right. Uh, would be, we'll just say that, that's seven, and then eight will be the um, the CV that was provided. Okay. The the uh, the last thing on this too is that this report from Mr. Heidel does not represent the entirety of what was discussed in that that phone call. But I think well, that, that what's that, in here that, that may be the case. But you've got my order, and it's limited sure. to the report. Cool. It, it's it's sufficient to, to get into what I need to get into with this thing. So, Judge, and Mr. Moran keeps referencing this, the information he wrote out on the endorsement. The court was clear it's limited to the report, so it's the actual information I got from Dr. Ha, so I know what he's saying. That's what my order said. Thank you, Judge. I beg your pardon. That is false. He will not be allowed to give more detailed testimony that was in contained in Investigator Heidel's report or in any previously filed expert disclosure. Right, and my understanding is there was no other expert disclosure, was there? Am I wrong about that? No, he, I have nothing else from his expert. I have I have a CV, and I have that interview. Mr. Moran did an expert endorsement. That's what prompted me to file the motion, which prompted the court's order. And we're all, and I'm not going to read the court's order to the court, but um, Mr. Moran picked a sentence out of it, and there's another sentence in it um, that also talks about. Um, he will be allowed to testify concerning the information contained in Investigator Heidel's report. It was marked as pages 24447 to 24454 of discovery period. And that was issued on October 18, 2020, and counsel's had near nine months um, with that order and that document. If you wanted to provide me with a report, I'd have been happy to receive it. Well, Your Honor, and if, my, if I... My, hold on. And my order indicates that that's what can be done if you want something else. That was the very last sentence of my order. Judge, yes. on February 25th, 2019, significantly in, in advance of the order that Mr. Johnson keeps referencing, I filed a disclosure with the court describing information we expected Dr. Ha to provide. So when Your Honor writes in an order that information that was gleaned from the discussion with Investigator Heidel that's in that eight-page report and any other previous disclosures, I think a reasonable reader takes away from that 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 February 2019 disclosure was part of what the court was describing. Well, your disclosure is really just a notice. It's not the actual report. It's not what Dr. Hyde Ha knows. And my order is pretty darn specific. It's, it, limited, it's limited to what's in the report and any <laughs> subsequent uh, disclosures, not from you. The disclosures are referring to reports or information about Dr. Ha that's different so that there can be, again, another interview. Does, does it make sense to everyone that this order came out after my does disclosure? Does it make sense that the order is the order and I'm done talking to okay. Mr. Moran? Then okay. it incorporates my disclosure, which I had to go over with Dr. Ha to say, may I file this with your endorsement on the top of it? Of course he approved it. It, it is what but I have to do. But it, this is your work product, not his. They're entitled to know what he thinks, not what you think he thinks. We're going to be in recess for another 15 minutes.